Uh, we also like to recognize people doing good works in the corporeal world. And this month and next month, we have a new charity, and that is Little Kids Rock. Um, we've done a lot of uh, uh, Heal the Planet, Save the World, Feed the People charities, um, but this is a new one for us. And hello, Blythe and Stranger. Um, Little Kids Rock goes I is an American charity. Um, it goes into public schools, doesn't go into public schools, but it um, helps revitalize music programs in the public schools. Um, a lot of what they do is provide uh, free musical instruments, but they do work um, as advocates for music in the public schools, which through the traditional means of, of funding a lot of that, along with other arts programs and um, um, athletics, um, are being sacrificed. Um, and there's some very compelling research that um, arts uh, involvement, um, especially music, um, helps build science and math skills. So um, it's a great program, uh, and uh, you can click on the panel there by the B-striped jar and find out more about Little Kids Rock. But that's what we're going to be doing. Um, this reading is, of course, completely free, and so you aren't obliged to tip us at all. But if you do, Toss it in the tip jar and you'll join us in supporting Little Kids Rock this month and next month. Uh, we have a standard group uh, we ha that you can join. Uh, we also have uh, two different types of subscriber. We have this, the Sean Key Library subscriber, which is the blue and green one in the back of the room. And that will get you notices and IMs and a weekly schedule on Sean Key Library events. We also have Stories Unlimited, which I manage, which is the brown one at the back of the room. And it, good heavens, they're falling out of the sky. Um, and it will get you one note card a day um, in the mornings. Um, and it will be not just, I'm hoping these are all people you know, Cram. <laughs> and it will be not just uh, Shanaki Library events, but any event um, across the, 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 the English-speaking part of the grid that uh, comes to my attention um, that has a plot. So it could be dance or machinima or theater or whatever. If it's got a plot, then it will go on that note card. Um, let's see what else. Uh, we don't have to talk about copyright because these letters are 200 years old. Um, <laughs> I think that's about it. Um, so uh, this has actually been a, a dream of mine for quite some time. Uh, the program um, is a little over an hour long, um, but hopefully we will make it worth your time. Uh, if you're interested, you can click on either of the portraits to find in out information about the people that the portraits are, are of, um, both Abigail Adams and President John Adams. Um, these letters all predate the presidency um, by a lot. Um, or you can, um, as I said, click on the Declaration of Independence behind us, and it too will open a URL link. Uh, either in your browser um, or in your viewer, and it will take you to the Massachusetts Historical Society website, which is where all these letters can be found. Yes, and Charles Adams, who also served the government. They had six children, um, two of whom, well, three of whom actually died quite young, but anyway. But on with that, um, because we have a lot of letters to go through. Um, we're doing letters from 1762, which is the very beginning of their correspondence, to um, quite literally the, the uh, July 3rd, 1776, um, where John writes Abigail two letters um, and the resolution for um, independence has been adopted by Congress at that point. So with that, um, thank you for your kind attention and here we go. Miss Adorable. By the same token that the bearer hereof sat up with you last night, I hereby order you to give him as many kisses and as many hours of your company after nine o'clock as he shall please to demand and charge them to my account. This order, or requisition, call it what you will, is in consideration of a similar order drawn upon Aurelia for the like favor, and I presume I have good right to draw upon you for the kisses, as I have given two or three million at least when one has been received, and of consequence, the account between us is immensely in favor of yours. John Adams, October 4th, 1762. Dear Madam, accidents are often more friendly to us than our own prudence. I intended to have been at Weymouth yesterday, but a storm prevented. Cruel, yet perhaps blessed storm. Cruel for detaining me from so much friendly social company and 
perhaps blessed to you or me or both, for keeping me at my distance. For every experimental philosopher knows that the steel and the magnet or the glass and the feather will not fly together with more celerity than somebody and somebody when brought within the striking distance and itches and aches and adieus and repentance might be the consequences of a contact in present circumstances. Even the divine pronounces caustically, I fear, unfit to be touched these three weeks. I mount this moment for that noisy, dirty town of Boston, where parade, pomp, nonsense, frippery, folly, foppery, luxury, politics, and the soul, confounding wrangles of the law, give me the higher relish for spirit, taste, and sense at Weymouth next Sunday. Yours, John Adams, Braintree, February 4th, 1763. Weymouth, August 11th, 1763. My friend, if I was sure your absence today was occasioned by what it generally is, either to wait upon company or promote some good work, I freely confess my mind would be much more at ease than it is at present. Yet this uneasiness does not arise from any apprehension of slight or neglect, but I fear least you are indisposed for that you said should be your only in hindrance. Humanity obliges me to be affected with the distresses and miseries of our fellow creatures. Friendship is a band yet stronger which causes us to feel the greater tenderness um, and the affliction of our friends. And there is a more binding tie than humanity and stronger than friendship which makes us anxious for the happiness and welfare of those to whom it binds us. It makes their misfortunes, sorrows, and afflictions our own. Unite these, and there is a threefold cord. By this cord, I am not ashamed to my own self to be bound, nor do I believe that you are wholly free from it. Judge you then for your Diana, for she not this day had sufficient cause for pain or anxiety of mind. She bids me tell you that Seneca, for the happiness of his Paulina, was careful and tender of his health. The health and happiness of Seneca, she says, was not dearer to his Paulina than that of Lysander to his Diana. The fabric often wants repairing. If we neglect it, the deity will no longer inhabit it. Yet after all our care and solicitude to preserve it, it is a tottering building and often reminds us that it will finally fall. Adieu. May this find you in better health than I fear it will. Happy as your Diana wishes you, accept this hasty scrawl, warm from the heart of your sincere Diana. Monday morning, 15 August, 1763. The disappointment you mentioned was not intended, but quite accidental. A gentleman for whom I had much esteem, Mr. Daniel Leonard of Norton, was so good as to offer to keep the Sabbath with me at Braintree a favor that would have been very agreeable if it had not detained me from the most agreeable of all company to me in this world, and a favor that I, will I know be sufficient with you to excuse me. Good night's sleep I have had, but more than, than I should have had, for a friend always keeps me awake till midnight and after. Shall I return from Boston, I hope time to obey, which I always do with more pleasure than I ever command. Yours, J. Adams. Weymouth, September 12, 1763. You were pleased to say that the receipt of a letter from your Diana always gave you pleasure. Whether this was designed for a compliment, a commodity I acknowledge that you very seldom deal in, or as a real truth, you best know. Yet if I was to judge for a certain person's heart by what upon the like occasion passes through the cabinet of my own, I should be apt to suspect it as a truth. And why may I not, when I have often been tempted to believe that they were both cast in the same mold, only with this difference, that yours was made with a harder metal, metal and therefore is less liable to take an impression. Whether they have both an equal quality of steel, I have not yet been able to discover, but do not imagine that they are either of them deficient. Supposing only this difference, I do not see why the same cause may not produce the same effect in both though perhaps not equal in degree. But after all, notwithstanding, we are told that the giver is more blessed than the receiver. I must confess that I am not of so generous a disposition in this case as to give without wishing for a return. 
Have you heard the news that two apparitions were seen one evening this week hovering about this house, which very much resembled you and a cousin of yours? How it should ever enter into the head of an apparition to assume a form like yours, I cannot devise. When I was told of it, I could scarcely believe it. Yet I could not declare the contrary, for I did not see it, and therefore had not that demonstration which generally convinces me that you are not a ghost. The original design of this letter was to tell you that I would next week be your fellow traveler, provided that I shall not be any encumbrance to you, for I have too much pride to be a clog to anybody. If you are determined to that point, your A. Smith. Boston, May 7th, 1764. <clears throat> I promised you some time ago a catalog of your faults or imperfections or defects or whatever you please to call them. I feel at present pretty much at leisure and in a very suitable frame of mind to perform my promise. But I must caution you before I proceed to recollect yourself and instead of being vexed and fretted or thrown into a passion to resolve upon a reformation for this is my sincere aim in laying before you this picture of yourself. In the first place, then, give me leave to say you have been extremely negligent in attending so little to cards. You have very little inclination to that noble and elegant diversion, and whenever you have taken the hand, you have held it but awkwardly and played it with a very uncourtly and indifferent air. Now I have confidence enough in your good sense to rely upon it, you will for the future endeavor to make a better figure in this elegant and necessary accomplishment. Another thing which ought to be mentioned, and by all means amended, is the effect of a country life and education. I mean, a certain modesty, a sensibility, a bashfulness, call it by which of these names you will, that enkindles blushes forsooth at every violation of decency in company, and lays, lays a most insupportable constraint on the freedom of behavior. Thanks to the late refinements of modern manners, hypocrisy, superstition, and formality have lost all reputation in the world, and the utmost sublimation of politeness and gentility lies in ease and freedom, or, in other words, in a, a natural air and behavior, and in expressing a, a satisfaction at whatever is suggested and prompted by nature, which the aforesaid violations of decency most certainly are. In the third place, you could never yet be prevailed on to learn to sing. This I take very soberly to be an imperfection of the most moment of any. An ear for music would be a source of much pleasure, and a voice and skill would be a private, solitary amusement of, of great value, but no other could be had. You must have remarked an example of this in Mrs. Cranch, who must in all probability have been deafened to death with the cries of her Betsy if she had not drowned them in music of her own. In the fourth place... You very often hang your head like a bulrush. You do not sit erected as you ought, by which means it happens that you appear too short for a beauty, and the company loses the sweet smiles of that countenance and the bright sparkle of those eyes. This fault is the effect and consequence of another still more inexcusable a lady. I mean a habit of a habit of reading and writing and thinking, but both the cause and the effect ought to be repented and amended as soon as possible. Another fault, which seems to have been obstinately persisted in after frequent remonstrances and advices and admonitions of your friends, is that of sitting with the legs across. This ruins the figure, the air, this injures the health, and springs, I fear, from the former source. Too much thinking. These things ought not to be. A sixth imperfection is that of walking with the toes bending inward. This imperfection is commonly called a parrot toad, I think. I know not for what reason, but well, to give you an idea, the reverse of a bold and noble air, the, the state, the reverse of the stately strut and, and the sublime deportment. Thus have I given a faithful portraiture of all the spots I have hitherto discerned in this luminary I have. Not regarded order, but have painted them as they arose my memory. Near three weeks have I conned and studied for more, but more are not to be discovered. All the rest is bright and luminous. Having finished the picture, I finish my letter, lest while I am recounting faults, I should commit the greatest of that in a letter, that of tedious and excessive length. There's a pretty turn conclusion for you. From your Lysander. 
Weymouth, May 9th, 1764. Welcome, welcome, thrice welcome is Lysander to Braintree, but ten times more so would he be at Weymouth, whither you are afraid to come. Once it was not so. May I not come and see you, at least look through a window at you? Should you not be glad to see your Diana? I flatter myself that you would. Your brother brought your letter, though he did not let me see him, delivered it, the doctor who received it safe. I thank you for your catalogue, but must confess I was so hardened as to read over most of my faults with as much pleasure as another person would have read their perfections. And Lysander must excuse me if I still persist in some of them, at least till I am convinced that an alteration would contribute to his happiness. Especially may I avoid that freedom of behavior, which, according to the plan given, consists of violations of decency, and which would render me unfit to herd even the brutes. And permit me to tell you, sir, nor disdain to be a learner, that there is such a thing as modesty without either hypocrisy or formality. As to a neglect of singing, that I acknowledge to be a fault, which, if possible shall not be complained of a second time, nor should you have had occasion for it now if I had not a voice as harsh as the screech of a peacock. <laughs> the capital fault shall be rectified, though not with any hopes of being looked upon as a beauty. To appear agreeable in the eyes of Lysander has been for years past and still is the height of my ambition. The fifth fault will endeavor to amend it, but, you know, I think the gentleman has no business concerning himself with the legs of a lady. For my part, I do not ap apprehend any bad effects from the practice yet since you desire it, and that you may not for the future trouble yourself so much about it, I will reform. The sixth and last can only be cured by dancing school. But I must write no more. I borrow a hint from you, therefore, will not add to my faults that of a tedious letter, a fault I never yet had reason to complain of in you, however long. They never were otherwise than agreeable to your own, A. Smith. September 30th, 1764. My dear Diana, I have this evening been to see the girl. What girl? Pray, what right have you to go after girls? Why, my dear, the girl I mentioned to you, Miss Alice Brackett, but Miss has hitherto acted in the character of housekeeper, and her noble aspiring spirit had rather rise to be a wife than descend to be a maid. To be serious, however, she says her uncle, whose house she keeps, cannot possibly spare her these two months, if then, and, and she has no thoughts of leaving him till the spring, when she intends for Boston to become a mantua maker. <laughs> so that we are still to seek. Girls enough from fourteen to four and twenty are mentioned to me, but the character of every mother's daughter of them is as yet problematical to me. Hannah Crane has sent several messages to my mother that she will live with you as a cheap as, as any girl in the country. She is stout and evil, for what I know, willing, but I, I fear not honest, for which reason I presume you will think of her no more. Another girl, one Rachel Marsh, has been recommended to me as a clever girl and a neat one, and one that wants a place. She's bred in the family of one of our substantial farmers and is likely understands a country business. But whether she would answer your purposes so well as another, I am somewhat in doubt. I have heard of a number of younger girls of 14 and thereabouts, but of these I suppose you would not choose. It must therefore be left with you to make inquiry and determine for yourself. If you could hear of a suitable person at Mystic or Newtown or in many accounts, uh, she would be preferable to one in your home. So much for maids, now for the man. I shall leave orders for Brackett to go to town Wednesday or Thursday with a horse cart. You'll get ready by that time and ship aboard as many things as you think proper. It happens very unfortunately that my business calls me away at this juncture for two weeks together, so that I, but I take no care at all about help of furniture or anything else. Necessity has no law. Tomorrow morning, embark for Plymouth with a, a foul, disordered stomach, a pale face, and an aching head and an anxious heart. And what company shall I find there? <laughs> My number of bawling lawyers, drunken squires, impertinent, stingy clients. If you realize this, my dear, since you have agreed to run fortunes with me, you will submit with less reluctance to any little 
disappointments and anxieties you may meet to the conduct of your own affairs. I have a great mind to keep a register of all the stories and squibs and jibes and compliments I shall hear through the whole week. If I should, I could entertain you with as much wit and humor and smut and filth and delicacy and modesty and decency, though not with so exact mimicry as a certain gentleman did the other evening. <clears throat> Do you wonder, my dear, why that gentleman does not succeed in business, when his whole study and attention has so manifestly been engaged in the nobler arts of smut, double entendre, mimicry of Dutchman. <laughs> Pardon me, my dear. You know that candor is my characteristic, as it is undoubtedly of all the ladies who are entertained with that gent's conversation. Oh, my dear girl, I thank heaven that another fortnight will restore you to me, and after so long a separation, my soul and body have both been thrown into disorder by your absence, and a month or two more with being the most insufferable cynic in the world, I fear. I see nothing but faults, follies, frailties, and defects in anybody lately. People have lost all their good properties or by, by justice or discernment. But you have always softened and warmed my heart, shall restore my benevolence as well as my health and tranquility of mind. You shall polish and refine my sentiments of life and manners, banish all the unsocial and ill-natured particles of my composition, and, and inform me to that happy temper that can reconcile a quick discernment with... With a perfect candor. Believe me, now and ever, your faithful Lysander. Boston, October 4th, 1764. Sir, I am much obliged to you for the care that you have taken about health. I am very willing to submit to some inconvenience in order to lessen your expenses, which I am sensible have run very high these past 12 months. And though you know I have no particular fancy for Judah, yet considering all things, and that your mamma and you seem to think it would be best to take her, I shall not at present look out any further. The cart you mentioned came yesterday, by which I sent as many things as the horse would draw. The rest of my things will be ready the Monday after you return from Taunton. And then, sir, if you please, you may take me. I hope that by that time you will have recovered your health, together with your former tranquility of mind. Think you that the philosopher who laughed at the follies of mankind did not pass through life with more ease and pleasure than he who wept at them, and perhaps did as much towards a reformation? Tis true that I have a good deal of fatigue in my own affairs, since I have been in town, but when I compare them with many other things that might have fallen to my lot, I am, I am left without any shadow of complaint. A few things, indeed, I have met with that really discomposed me. One was having a corrosive applied when a lenative would have answered the same good purpose. But I hope I have drawn a lesson from that which will be useful to me in futurity. Never say a severe thing, because to a feeling heart they wound too deeply to be easily cured. Pardon me, this is not said for a recriminate. And I have only mentioned it that whenever there is occasion, a different method may be taken. I do not think of anything further to add, nor anything new to tell you, for it is an old story, though I hope as pleasing as it is true, to tell you that I am unfeignedly your Diana. On October 25th, 1764, five days before his 29th birthday, John Adams married Abigail Smith at Weymouth, Massachusetts. They had six children, Abigail, <laughs> future President John Quincy, Susanna, Charles, Thomas Boylston, and Elizabeth. In 1770, a street confrontation resulted in British soldiers killing five civilians in what became known as the Boston Massacre. The soldiers involved were arrested on criminal charges, not surprisingly. They had trouble finding legal counsel to represent them. Finally, they asked Adams to defend. He accepted, though he feared it would hurt his reputation. In their defense, Adams made his now famous quote regarding making decisions based on evidence. Facts are stubborn things. Whatever may be our way, our wishes, our, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passions, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence. Six soldiers were acquitted. Two who had fired directly into the crowd were charged with murder, but were convicted only of manslaughter. Adams was paid 18 guineas by the British soldiers, or about the cost of a pair of shoes. 
Despite, here, despite his previous misgivings, Adams was elected to the Massachusetts General Court, the colonial legislature, in June of 1770, while still in preparation for the trial. Massachusetts sent Adams to the First and Second Continental Congresses, beginning in 1774. Falmouth, July 6, 1774. Mobs are the trite topic of declamation and invective. Among all the ministerial people far and near, they are grown universally learned in nature and tendency and consequences of them, and very eloquent and pathetic in descanting upon them. They are the sources of all kinds of evils, vices, and crimes, they say. They, they give rise to profaneness, intemperance, thefts, robberies, murders, and treason. Cursing, swearing, drunkenness, gluttony, lewdness, trespasses, and maims are necessarily involved in them and occasioned by them. Besides, they render the populace, the, the rabble, the scum of the earth, insolent and disorderly, impudent and abusive. They give rise to lying, hypocrisy, chicanery, even perjury among the people who are driven to such artifices and crimes to conceal themselves or their companions from prosecutions in consequence of them. This is the picture drawn by the Tory pencil. It must be granted to be a, a likeness. This is declamation. What consequences to be drawn from this description? Shall we submit to parliamentary taxation to avoid mobs? Will not parliamentary taxation, if established, occasion vices, crimes, and follies, infinitely more numerous, dangerous, and fatal to this community? Will not parliamentary taxation, if established, raise a revenue unjustly and wrongfully? If this revenue is scattered by the hand of corruption among the public officers and magistrates and rulers, in the community will not propagate vices more numerous, more malignant and pestilential among them, will not render magistrates servile and frowning, fawning to their vicious superiors and insolent and tyrannical to their inferiors. Is insolence, abuse, and impudence more tolerable in a magistrate than in a subject? Is it not more constantly and extensively pernicious? And does not the example of vice and folly in magistrates descend and spread downwards among the people? Are not riots raised and made by armed men as bad as those by unarmed? Is not the assault upon a civil officer and a rescue of a prisoner of lawful authority made by soldiers with swords or bayonets as bad as if made by tradesmen with staves? Is not the killing of a child and the slaughter of half a dozen citizens by a party of soldiers as Bad as pulling down a house or drowning a cargo of tea, even if both should be allowed to be unlawful. Parties may go on declaiming, but it is not easy to say which parties excited the most riots, which has published most libels, which have propagated most slander and defamation. Verbal scandal has been propagated in great abundance by both parties, but there is the difference. Now, one party has enjoyed almost all public offices and Therefore, their defamation has been spread among the people more secretly, more maliciously, more effectually. It has gone with greater authority and been scattered by instruments more industrious. The ministerial newspapers have swarmed as numerous and as malicious libels as the, the Whigs' interministerial ones. <clears throat> Fleet's papers, Maine's Chronicle, and etc., etc., have, have been as virulent as, as any that was ever in the province. These bickerings of opposing parties and their mutual approaches, their declamations, their sing-song, their triumphs and defiances, their dismals and prophecies are all delusions. We very seldom hear any solid reasoning. I wish always to discuss the question without all painting, pathos, rhetoric, or flourish of every kind. And the question seems to me to be whether the American colonies are to be considered as a distinct community so far as to have a right to judge for themselves when the fundamentals of their government are destroyed or invaded, or whether they are to be considered as a part of the whole British Empire, the whole English nation, so as far to be bound in honor, conscience, or interest by the general sense of the whole nation. Whether this was the rule, I believe it is very far from the general sense of the whole nation that America should be taxed by the British Parliament, if the sense of all of the empire could be fairly and truly collected. It would appear, I believe, that a the great majority would be against taxing us, against or without our consent. It is very certain that the sense of Parliament is not the sense of the Empire, nor a sure indication of it. But if all other parts of the Empire were agreed unanimously in the propriety and the rectitude of taxing us, this would not bind us. It is a fundamental, inherent, and unalienable right of the people that they have some check, influence, or control 
in our supreme legislature. The right of taxation is conceded to Parliament. The Americans have no check or influence at all left. His reasoning never was, nor can be answered. John Adams. Braintree, August 19th. 1774. The great distance between us makes the time appear very long to me. It seems already a month since you left me. The great anxiety I feel for my country, for you and for our family, renders the day tedious and the night unpleasant. The rocks and quicksands appear on every side. What course you can or will take is all wrapped in the bosom of futurity. Uncertainty and expectation leave the mind great scope. Did ever any kingdom or state regain their liberty when once it was invaded without bloodshed? I cannot think of it without horror. Yet we are told that all the misfortunes of Sparta were occasioned by their too great solicitude, solicitude for present tranquility, and by an excessive love of peace, they neglected the means of making it sure and lasting. They ought to have reflected, as Polybius says, that as there is nothing more desirable or advantageous than peace, when founded in justice and honor, so there is nothing more shameful and at the same time more pernicious when attained by bad measures and purchased at the price of liberty. I want much to hear from you. I long impatiently to have you upon the stage of action. The first of September or the month of September perhaps may be as of much importance to Great Britain as the Ides of March were to Caesar. I wish you every public as well as private blessing and that wisdom which is profitable both for instruction and edification to conduct you in this difficult day. The little flock, remember Papa, and kindly wish to see him. So does your most affectionate, Abigail Adams. Philadelphia, September 14, 1774. My dear, I have written but once to you since I left you. This is to be imputed to a variety of causes which I cannot explain for want of time, but I fill volumes to give you an exact idea of the whole tour. My time is so totally filled with from the moment I get out of bed until I return to it, visits, ceremonies, company, business, news, papers, pamphlets, etc., etc. The Congress will, to all present appearance, be well united, and in such measures I, well, I hope will give satisfaction to the friends of our country. The Massachusetts counselors and Addressers are held in curious esteem here, as you will see. The spirit, the firmness, the, the prudence of our province are vastly applauded. We are universally acknowledged the, the saviors and defenders of American liberty. The designs and plans of the Congress must not be communicated until completed. We shall move, uh, we shall move with great deliberation. When I shall come home, I know not. But at present, I don't expect to take my leave for the city for f these four weeks. Uh, my compliments, love, service where they are due, and babes are never out of my mind nor absent from my heart. Adieu, John Adams. Philadelphia, September 16, 1774. Having a leisure moment while the Congress is assembling, I gladly embrace it to write you a line. When the Congress first met, Mr. Cushing made a motion that it should be open with a prayer. It was opposed to Mr. J. of North New York, and by Mr. Rutledge of South Carolina, because we were so divided in religious sentiments. Some Episcopalians, some Quakers, some Anabaptists, some Presbyterians, and some Congregationalists. <laughs> so we could not join in the same act of worship. And Mr. Samuel Adams arose and said that he was no bigot, and could hear a prayer from a gentleman of piety and virtue, who was at the same time a friend to his country. He was a stranger in Philadelphia, but had heard that Mr. Boucher deserved that character, and therefore he, he moved that Mr. Duche, an Episcopal clergyman, might be desired to read prayers to the Congress tomorrow morning. The motion was seconded and passed to the affirmative. Mr. Randolph, our president, waited on Mr. Duche and received for answer that if his health would permit, he, he certainly would. Accordingly, next morning, when he appeared with his clerk, and he read several prayers in the established form, and, and he read the collect for the seventh day of September which was the 35th Psalm. You must remember this was the next morning after we heard the horrible rumor of the candidate of Boston. I never saw a greater effect upon an audience that seemed 
It was if heaven had ordained that song be read on that morning. After this, Mr. Duchesne unexpected to everybody struck out in a temporary prayer which filled the bosom of every man present. I say, I must confess, I, I never heard a better prayer or one so well pronounced. Episcopalian as he is, Dr. Cooper himself never prayed with such fervor, such ardor, such earnestness and pathos in, in language so elegant and sublime. For America, for the Congress, for the province of Massachusetts Bay, and especially for the town of Boston, it's had an excellent effect upon everybody here. When we lose your friends, I think, to read this letter on the 35th Psalm to them. Read it to your father and Mr. Wibbert. I, I wonder what our Braintree Churchman would think of this. Mr. Duche is one of the most ingenious men and best characters and greatest orators in the Episcopal order on this continent, yet a zealous friend of liberty in his country. I long to see my dear family. God bless, preserve, and prosper it. Adieu, John Adams. Philadelphia, October 9, 1774. Ah, oh, my dear, I am wearied to death for life I lead here. The business of the Congress is tedious beyond expression. The assembly is like no other that ever existed. Every man is a, is a great man and orator, a, a critic, a statesman, and therefore every man upon every question must show it his oratory, his criticisms, political abilities. The consequence of this is... Business is drawn and spun out to an uh, unmeasurable length. I, I believe it was moved and seconded that we should come to resolution that three and two make five. We, we should be entertained with logic and rhetoric and law and history and politics and mathematics and serve the subject for two whole days. And then we should pass the resolution unanimously in the affirmative. <clears throat> I do. John Adams. Brain Tree, October 16th, 1774. Much loved friend, I dare not express to you at 300 miles distance how ardently I long for your return. I have some very miserly wishes. I cannot consent your spending one hour in town until at least I have had you 12. The idea plays about my heart, unnerves my hand whilst I write, awakens all tender sentiments that years have increased and matured and which, when you were with me, was every day dispensing to you. The whole collected stock of nine, ten weeks' absence <sighs> knows not how to brook any longer restraint, but will break forth and flow through my pen. May the like sentiments enter thy breast, and, in spite of all the weighty cares of state, mingle themselves with those I wish to communicate, for in giving them utterance I have felt more sincere pleasure than I have known since the 10th of August. Many have been the anxious hours I have spent since the day, that day, the, the threatening aspect of our public affairs, the complicated distress, distress of this province, the arduous and perplexed business in which you are engaged have all conspired to agitate my bosom with fears and apprehensions to which I have heretofore been a stranger. Far from thinking the scene close, it looks as though the curtain was but just drawn, and only the first scene of the infernal plot disclosed, and whether the end will be tragical, heaven alone knows. You cannot be, I know, nor do I wish to see you an inactive spectator, but if the sword, sword be drawn, I bid adieu to all domestic felicity, and look forward to that country where there is neither wars nor rumors of wars in a firm belief that through the mercy of its king we shall both rejoice there together. I greatly fear that the arm of treachery and violence are lifted over us as a scourge and heavy punishment from heaven for our numerous offenses and for the misimprovement of our great advantages. If we express, express the bl expect the blessings to inherit the blessings of our fathers, we should return a little more to their primitive simplicity of manners and not sink into inglorious ease. We have too many high-sounding words and too few actions that correspond with them. I rejoice at the favorable account you give me of your health. May it continue, be continued to you. My health is much better than it was last fall. Some folks say I, I grow very fat. <laughs> I venture to write most anything in this letter because I know the, the care of the bearer. He will be most sadly disappointed if you should be broke up before he arrives and he is very desirous of being introduced by you to a number of gentlemen of respectable character. 
I almost envy him that be he should see you before I can. Your mother sends her love to all your family, too numerous to name, um, and they all desire to be remembered. You will receive letters from two who are as earnest to write to Papa as if the welfare of a kingdom depended upon it. If you can give any guess within a month, let me know when you think of returning to your most affectionate, Abigail Adams. March 29, 1776. I give you joy of Boston and Charleston, once more the habitations of Americans. I'm waiting with great impatience for letters from you, which I know will contain many particulars. We are taking precautions to defend every place that is in danger, the Carolinas, Virginia, northern New York, Canada. I can think of nothing but fortifying Boston Harbor. I want, I want more cannon that are to be had. I want a fortification upon Point Alderton, one upon Lovell's Island, one upon Georgia's Island, several upon Long Island, one, one upon the moon, one upon Squantum. I want to hear of half a dozen fire ships and two or three hundred fire rafts repaired. I want to hear of rogue galleys, floating batteries built and booms laid across the channel and the narrows and the side of freeze sunk in it. I, I wish to hear that you are translating Braintree Commons into the town. No efforts, no expense are too extravagant for me to wish for to fortify that harbor so as to make it impregnable. I hope everybody will join and work until it is done. We have this week lost a very valuable friend of the colonies in Governor Ward of Rhode Island by the, the smallpox in a natural way. He never would hearken to his friends who have been constantly advising him to be inoculated ever since the, the first Congress began, but he would not be persuaded. Numbers who have been inoculated have gone through the distemper without any danger or even confinement, and nothing would do. He must take it in the natural way and die. He was an amiable and sensible man, a steadfast friend to his country upon very pure principles. His funeral was attended with the same solemnities as Mr. Randolph's, Mr. Stillman being the Anabaptist church minister here, and of which persuasion was the governor, was desired by Congress to preach a sermon, which he did with great applause. Remember me as you ought. Braintree, March 31st, 1776. I wish you would ever write me a letter half as long as I write you, and tell me, if you may, where your fleet are gone, what sort of defense Virginia can make against our common enemy, whether it is so situated as to make an able defense. Are not the gentry lords and the common people vassals? Are they not like the uncivilized natives Britons represent us to be? I hope their riflemen, who have shown themselves to be very savage, and even bloodthirsty, are not a specimen of the generality of the people. I am willing to allow the colony great merit for having produced a Washington, but they have been shamefully duped in a Dunmore. I have sometimes been ready to think that the passion for liberty cannot be equally strong in the breasts of those who have been accustomed to deprive their fellow creatures of theirs. Of this I am certain, that it is not founded upon that generous Christian principle of doing to others as we would that others should do unto us. Do not you want to see Boston? I, I am fearful of the smallpox, or I should have been there before this time. I got Mr. Crane to our house to see what state it was in. I find it has been occupied by one of the doctors of a regiment, very dirty, but no damage has been done to it. The few things which were left in it are all gone. Cranch has the key, which he never delivered up. I have wrote to him for it, and am determined to get it cleaned as soon as possible and shut it up. I look upon it as a new acquisition of property, a property which one month ago I did not value a single shilling, and could with pleasure have seen it in flames. The town in general is left in a better state than we expected, more owing to a precipitate flight than any regard to the inhabitants, though... Some individuals discovered a sense of honor and justice and have left rent in the houses in which they were for the owners and the furniture unhurt, hurt or if damaged, sufficient to make it good. Others have committed abominable ravages. The mansion house of your president is safe and the furniture unhurt, while both, both the house and furniture of the solicitor general of the king have fallen a prey to their own merciless party. Surely the very fiends feel a reverential awe for virtue and patriotism while they detest the parricide and traitor. I feel very differently at the approach of spring than I did a month ago. We knew not then whether we could plant or sow with safety. 
whether we had toiled what we could reap the fruits of our own industry, whether we could rest in our own cottages, whether we should not be driven from the seacoast to seek shelter in the wilderness. But now we feel we might sit under our own vine and eat the good of the land. I feel a gaiety decor, which, which before I was a stranger to. I think the sun looks brighter, the birds sing more melodiously, and nature puts on a more cheerful countenance. We feel a temporary peace, and the poor fugitives are returning to their deserted habitations. I long to hear that you have declared an independency. And by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire that you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power in the hands of husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. That your sex are naturally tyrannical is a truth so thoroughly established as to admit of no dispute. But such of you as wish to be happy willingly give up the harsh title of master for the more tender and endearing one of friend. Why then not put it out put out of the power of the vicious and the lawless to use us with cruelty, indignity, and impunity? Men of sense in all ages abhor those customs which treat us only as the vassals of your sex. Regard us then as beings placed by providence under your protection, and in the imitation of the supreme being, make use of that power only for our happiness. April 21st, 1776. I have to acknowledge the receipt of very few lines dated, um, I have to receipt, acknowledge the receipt of very few lines dated the 12th of April. You make no mention of the whole sheets I have wrote to you, by which I judge you either never received them, or that they were so lengthy as to be troublesome. And in return, you have set me an example of being very concise. I believe I shall not take the hint, but give as I love to receive. We have intelligence of the arrival of some of the Tory fleet at Halifax, that they are much distressed for want of houses, obliged to give six dollars per month for one room, provisions scarce and dear. Some women, some of them with six or eight children round them, sitting on the rocks, crying, not knowing where to lay their heads. Just heaven has given them a taste of the same cup of affliction which they one year ago administered with such callous hearts to thousands of their fellow citizens. But with this difference, that they fly from their injured and enraged country, whilst pity and commiseration receive the sufferers whom they inhumanely drove from their dwellings. I would fain hope that the time may not be too far distant when those things you hint at may be carried to execution. It is reported here that Admiral Hoppings is blocked up, is, is blocked up in Newport Harbor by the number of ten men of war. If so, it is a very unlucky circumstance. As to the fortifications of those who preside in the assembly, you, they can give a much better account than I. So... Go on and give your long list of domestic affairs, but they, I, would, I would only serve to embarrass you and in no ways relieve myself. I hope it will not be long before things will be brought into such a train that you may be spared to your family. You have not once told me how you do. I judge that you are well, as you seem to be in good spirits. I bid you good night. All the little flock send duty and want to see Papa. Adieu. Shall I say, remember me as ought? April 28, 1776. Yesterday I received two letters from you on the 7th and the 14th of April. I believe I've received all your letters, and I am not certain I wrote one from Framingham. The one I mean contains an account of my dining with the Indians at Mr. Mifflin. It gives me concern to think of the many cares you must have upon your mind. I'm glad you have taken Belcher into pay, and that Isaac is well before now, I hope. Your reputation as a farmer or anything else you undertake, I dare answer, dare answer for. Your partner's character as a statesman is much more problematical. As to my return, I have not a thought of it. Journeys of such length are tedious, expensive, both in time and money, neither of which are my own. And 
I hope to spend the next Christmas where I did the last, and after that I hope to be relieved. For by that time I shall have taken a pretty good turn at the helm, whether the vessel has been well steered or not. <laughs> but if my countrymen should insist upon my serving them another year, they must let me bring my whole family with me. Indeed, I could keep my house here with my partner, four children and two servants, as cheap as I maintain myself here with two horses and a servant at lodgings. Instead of domestic felicity, I, I am destined to public contentions. Instead of rural felicity, I must reconcile myself to the smoke and noise of a city. In the place of private peace, I must be distracted with the vexation of developing the deep intrigues of politicians and must assist in conducting the arduous operations of war. I think myself well rewarded. My private pleasures and interests are sacrificed as they ever have been and will be to the happiness of others. Such a mixture of folly, littleness, and knavery in this world that I am weary of it. And although I behold it with unutterable contempt and indignation, yet the public good requires that I should take no notice of it, by word or by letter, and to this public good I will conform. There is no way for two friendly souls to converse together, although the bodies are 400 miles off? Yes, by letter. But I want a better communication. I want to, I want to hear you think, to see your thoughts. The conclusion of your letter makes my heart throb more than a candidate would. You bid me burn your letters, but I must forget you first. In yours of April 14, you say you miss our friend in the conveyance of your letters. Don't hesitate to rape by the post. See you well, don't miss a single post. You take it for granted that I have a particular intelligence of everything from others. But I have not. If anyone wants a vote for a commission, he, he vouchsafes me a letter, but he tells me very little news. I have more particulars from you than anyone else. Pray keep me constantly informed. What ships are in the harbor and what fortifications are going on. I am quite impatient to hear of a more vigorous measures for fortifying Boston Harbor. Not a moment should be neglected. Every man ought to go down as they did after the Battle of Lexington and work until it's done. I would willingly pay half a dozen hands myself and subsist them rather than it should not be done immediately. It is of more importance than to raise corn. The late act of Parliament has made so deep an impression upon people's minds throughout the colonies. It is looked upon as the last stretch of oppression as we are hastening rapidly to great events. Governments will be up everywhere before midsummer in an end to royal style, titles of authority. Such mighty revolutions make a deep impression on the minds of men and set many violent passions at work. Hope, fear, joy, sorrow, love, hatred, malice, envy, revenge, jealousy, ambition, avarice, resentment, gratitude, and every other passion, feeling, sentiment, principle, imagination, were never in more lively exercise than they are now, from Florida to Canada inclusively. May God and his providence overrule the whole, for the good of mankind requires more serenity of temper, a deeper understanding, and more courage than fell to the lot of Marlborough to, to ride in this whirlwind. May 9th, 1776. I this day received yours of the 20th of April, accompanied with a letter upon government. Upon reading it, I somehow or other felt an uncommon affection for it. I could not but help but thinking it was a near relation to a very intimate friend of mine, if I'm not mistaken in its descent. I know it has a near affinity to the sentiments of that person, and though I cannot pretend to be an adept in the art of government, Yet it looks rational that a government of good laws well administered should carry with them the fairest prospect of happiness to a community as well as to individuals. But as this is a prerogative to which your sex lay almost an exclusive claim, I shall quit the subject after having quoted a passage in favor of a republic from an anonymous author entitled Essays on the Genius and Writings of Pope. The fine arts, in short, are naturally attendant upon power and luxury, but the sciences require unlimited freedom to raise them to their full vigor and growth. In a monarchy, there may be poets, painters, and mus musicians, but orators, historians, and philosophers can exist in a republic alone. The Roman nation, by their unjust attempt at, upon the liberty of the world, justly lost their own. With their liberty, they lost not only their force of eloquence, 
but even their style and language them itself. The spirit of fortification has just awakened, and we are now pursuing with vigor what ought before this time to have been completed. Fort Hill, the castle, Dorchester Point, Noddles Island are almost completed. A committee are sent down to Nantasket, and orders are given to fortify the moon, Gorgeous Island, etc. Let me hear from you often. Yours, unfeignedly. Braintree, 27th of May, 1776. What can be the reason that I have not heard from you since the 20th of April, and now it is the 27th of May? My anxious, foreboding heart fears every evil, and my nightly slumbers are tortured. I have sent and sent again to the post office, which is now kept in Boston, at the office of the former Solicitor General. Not one line for me, though your handwriting is seen to several others. Not a scrip have I had since the General Assembly rose, and our worthy friend Warren left Watertown. I fear you are sick. The very idea casts such a gloom upon my spirits that I cannot recover them for hours, nor reason myself out of my fears. Surely, if letters are delivered by any other hand than those to whose, they, whose care they are directed, tis cruel to detain them. I believe for the future you had better direct them to be left in the post office, from whence I shall be sure of obtaining them. I wrote you two letters about a fortnight ago, which were both covered together. Hope that you have received them. We have no news here but what you will be informed of long before this reaches you, unless it is the politics of the town. The disagreeable news we have from Quebec is a great damper on our spirits, but shall we receive good and not evil? Upon this occasion you will recollect the sentiments of your favorite, Sully. Without attempting to judge the future, which depends upon too many accidents, how much less subject it to our precipitation in bold and difficult enterprises. We should endeavor to subdue one obstacle at a time, not suffer ourselves to be depressed by their greatness or their and their number. We ought never to despair of what has been once accomplished. How many things have the idea of impossible been annexed to that have become easy to those who knew how to take advantage of time, opportunity, lucky moments, and the faults of others, different dispositions, and an infinite number of other circumstances? These are the sentiments worthy of the man who could execute what he planned. I sincerely wish that we had the spirit of Sully animating our, counts, our councils and our counselors. May 27th. My heart is light as a feather and my spirits are dancing. I received this afternoon a fine parcel of letters and papers by Colonel Thayer. It was a feast to me and I shall rest in quiet, I hope, this night. The papers have not been read, but I will sit down and write you, for Mr. Bass has just left here and let me know that Harry will call upon him tomorrow and take this letter for me. I would not have you anxious about me. I wish my abilities were equal to my wishes. My father and your, my father and your mother desire to be remembered to you in very particular terms. The family you mention are well, so is your brother's. Uh, you are your own are tolerably comfortable. Charles has the mumps and has been very sick, but is now better. I took a ride last week and ventured just as far as the stump of Liberty Tree. Roxbury looks more injured than Boston. That, um, that is, houses look more torn to pieces. I was astonished at the extensiveness of our lines and their, and their strength. You have taken a most noble prize, the inventory of which you have in the paper. Poor captain has since lost his life in a desperate engagement with 13 boats from a men of war which attacked him and attempted to board him, but by a most brave resistance they sunk four boats and fought so warmly with their spears and small arms as to oblige them to quit him, though he had but 27 men and they five times his number. He unhappily fell and was the only one who did. I hope after election we shall have ways and means to devise to drive off these torments. Providence seems to have delivered into our hands the very articles most needed, and at a time when we are weak and not so well provided for as we could wish. We have two row galleys building, and men of spirit to use them. I, da I dare say they will be found. One engagement only whets their appetite for another. 
I heard last night that we had three regiments coming back to us with General Gates to head them, at which I most sincerely rejoiced. I think he is the man we want. Believe you may venture letters safely by post. Mine go that way, and for the future I will send the post office for yours. You ask my advice with regard to your office. If I was to consult only my own private satisfaction and pleasure, I should request you to resign it. But as that is of, as of a small moment when compared to the whole, I think you qualified to know you, disposed, you are disposed to serve your country. I must advise you to hold it, at least for the present year. And in saying this, I make a sacrifice which those can only judge whose hearts are won. The season promises very fair for grass and a fine bloom upon the trees. Warm weather we want, which will make everything look finely. I wish you could be here to enjoy it. I want to bid you good night. Oh, oh that I could annihilate space. Yours. June 2nd, 1776. Yesterday I dined with Captain Richards, the, the gentleman who made me the president of the Brass Pistols. We had cherries, strawberries, and green peas in plenty. The fruits are three weeks earlier here than with Hugh. Indeed, they, they're a fortnight here earlier than on the east and, and on the west side of Delaware River. We have had green peas this week past, but they are brought over the river from New Jersey to this market. There are none grown in the city or on the west side of the river yet. The reason is the soil of New Jersey is a warm sand, that of Pennsylvania cold clay, so much for peas and berries. Now for something of more importance. In all the correspondences I have maintained during a course of 20 years, at least that I have been a writer of letters, I, I never kept a single copy. This negligence and inaccuracy has been a great misfortune to me on many occasions. I have now purchased a folio book, in the first page of which, excepting one blank leaf, I am writing this letter and intend to write all my letters to you in it from this time forward. This will be an advantage to me in several respects. In the first place, I shall write more deliberately. In the second place, I shall be able at all times to review what I have written. I shall know how often I write, and for I shall discover by this means whether any of my letters to you miscarry. If it were, possi if it were possible for me to find a conveyance, I would, would send you another blank book as a present that you might begin the practice at the same time, for I really think that your letters are much better worth preserving than mine. Your daughter and sons will very soon write so good hand that they will copy the letters for you from your book, which will improve them at the same time that it relieves you. Plymouth, June 17, 1776. A remarkable day. I this day received by the hands of our worthy friend a large packet which has refreshed and comforted me. Your own sensations have ever been similar to mine. I need not tell you how gratified I am at the frequent tokens of remembrance with which you favor me, nor how they rouse every tender sensation of my soul, which sometimes find vent at my eyes, or nor I dare describe how earnestly I long to fold my fluttering heart, the dear object of my warmest affections. The idea soothes me. I feast upon it with a pleasure known only to those whose hearts and hopes are one. The approbation you give me give to my conduct in the management of our private affairs is very grateful to me and sufficiently compensates for all my anxieties and endeavors to discharge the many duties devolved upon me in consequence of the absence of my dear friend. Were they discharged equal to my wishes, I should merit the praises that you bestow. I see, oh, you see, I date from Plymouth. Here I came to visit our amiable friends, accompanied by my sister Betsy a day or two ago. It is the first night I have been absent since you left me. Having determined upon this visit for some time, I put my family in order and prepared for it, thinking that I might leave it with safety. Yet the day I set out, I was under many apprehensions by the coming in of ten transports, who were seen to have many soldiers on board, and the determination of the people to go and fortify upon Long Island, Pettix Island, Nantasket, and Great Hill. It was apprehended that they would attempt to land somewhere, but the next morning I had the pleasure to hear that they were all driven out, Commodore and all, not a transport, not a ship or a tender to be seen. 
this shows what might have been long ago done. Had this been done in season, the 10 transports with many others in all probability will have fallen into our hands, but the progress of wisdom is slow. Since I arrived here, I have really had a scene quite novel to me. The brig defense from Connecticut put in here for ballast. The officers who were all from thence and who were intimately acquainted with Dr. Lorthrop invited his lady to come on board and to bring with her as many of her friends as she could collect. She sent an invitation to our friend Mrs. Warren and to us. The brig lay about a mile and a half from town. The officers sent their barge and we went. Every mark of respect and attention which was in their power they showed us. She's a fine brig, mounts 16 guns, 12 swivels and carries 120 men. 117 were on board and no private family ever appeared under better regulation than the crew. It was as still as, it was as, still as though there had been only a half a dozen not a profane word among them. We spent a very agreeable afternoon and drank tea on board. They showed us their arms, which were sent by Queen Anne, and everything on board was a curiosity to me. They gave us a mock engagement with an enemy and the manner of taking a ship. The young folks went upon quarterdeck and danced. Some of their jacks played very well upon the violin and German flute. The brig bears the continental colors and was fitted out by the colony of Connecticut. As we set off from the brig, they fired their guns in honor of us, a ceremony I would very readily have dispensed with. <clears throat> I pity you and feel that you, under all these difficulties that you have, feel for you for all the difficulties you have to encounter. My daily petitions to heaven for you are that you may have health, wisdom, and fortitude sufficient to carry through the great and arduous business in which you are engaged, and that your endeavors may be crowned with success. Canada seems a dangerous and ill-fated place. It is reported here that General Thomas is no more, that he took the smallpox and died with it. Every day some circumstance arises and shows me the importance of having that distemper in youth. Dr. Bullfinch has petitioned the general court for leave to open a hospital somewhere, and it will be granted him. I shall, with all the children, be one of the first class. You may depend upon it. I have just this moment heard that the brig on which I was on board Saturday and which sailed yesterday morning from this place fell in with two transports, having each of them 150 men on board and took them and, was brought, and has brought them into Nantasket Road under the cover of guns which are mounted there. <laughs> we will add, I will add further particulars as soon as I am informed. I feel no great anxiety at the large armament designed against us. The remarkable a remarkable interpositions of heaven in our favor cannot be too gratefully acknowledged. He who fed the Israelites in the wilderness, who cloths the lilies of the field and feeds the young ravens when they cry, will not forsake a people engaged in so righteous a cause if we remember his loving kindness. We wanted powder. We have a supply. We wanted guns. We have been favored in that respect. We wanted hard money. Twenty-two thousand dollars and an equal value of plate are delivered into our hands. You mention your peas, your cherries, your strawberries, etc. Ours are but just in blossom. We have had the coldest spring I ever knew. Things are three weeks back of what they generally used to be. The corn looks poor. The season is now rather dry. Our friend, Dr. Warren, has refused his appointment. I am very sorry. I say everything I, th I said, everything I could think of to persuade him, but his lady was against it. I need say no more. I believe I did not understand you when, in a former letter, you said, I want to resign my office for a thousand reasons. If you meant that of judge, I know not what to say. I know it will be a difficult and arduous station, but divesting myself of private interest, which would lead me to be against her holding that office, I know of no other person so well calculated to discharge the trust, or who I think would act on, more, on a more conscientious part. My paper is full. I have only room to thank you for it. Philadelphia, July 3rd, 1776. Your favor of June 17, dated at Plymouth, was handed me by yesterday's post. I was much pleased to find that you had taken a journey to Plymouth to see your friends in the long absence of one whom you may wish to see. I was informed a day or two before the receipt of your letter that you was gone to Plymouth by Mrs. 
Lee Palmer, who was obliging enough in your absence to inform me of the particulars of the expedition to the lower harbor against the men of war. Her narration is executed with a precision and uh, perspicuity which would have become the pen of an accomplished historian. I have one favor to ask, dear, and that is that in your future letters you would acknowledge receipt of all those you may receive from me and mention their dates. By this means, I shall know if any of mine miscarry. The information you gave me of our friends refusing this appointment has, has given me much pain and grief and anxiety. I believe I shall be obliged to follow his example. I, I have not fortune enough to support my family and what is of more importance to support the dignity of that exalted station. It is too high and lifted up for me who delight in nothing so much as retreat, solitude, silence, and obscurity. In private life, no one has a right to censure me for following my own inclinations retirement, simplicity, and frugality. In public life, uh, every man, every man has a right to remark as he pleases, at least he thinks so. Yesterday, the greatest question was decided, which, whichever was debated in America, and a greater perhaps never was or will be decided among men. A resolution was passed without one dissenting colony that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, and as such they have and of right ought to have full power to make war, conclude peace, establish commerce, and to do all the other acts and things which other states may rightfully do. You will see in a few days a declaration setting forth the causes which have impelled us to this mighty revolution and the reasons which will justify it. In the sight of God and of man, the plan of confederation will be taken up in a few days. When I look back to the year 1761, and recollect the argument concerning writs of assistance in the superior court, which I have hitherto considered as the commencement of the controversy between Great Britain and America. And I run through the whole period from that time to this, and recollect a series of political events, the chain of causes and effects. I am surprised at the suddenness as well as grace of this revolution. Britain has been filled with folly, and America with wisdom. At least this is my judgment. Time must determine. It is the will of heaven that the two countries should be sundered forever. It may be the will of heaven that America shall suffer calamities still more wasting and distresses yet more dreadful. But this is to be the case. It will have this good effect at least. It will inspire us with many virtues which we have not to correct many errors, follies, and vices which threaten to disturb, dishonor, and destroy us. The furnace of affliction produces refinement in, in states as well as in individuals. And the new governments are assuming in every part will require a purification from our vices and an augmentation of our virtues, or there will be no blessings. The people will have unbounded power. The people are extremely addicted to corruption and banality, as well as the great. I am not without apprehensions from this quarter. I must submit all my hopes and fears to an overruling providence, in which, unfashionable as the faith may be, I firmly believe. On June 7, 1776, Adams seconded the resolution of independence introduced by Richard Henry Lee, which stated, These colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. He championed the resolution until it was adopted by Congress on July 2nd, 1776. Later the same day as the previous letter, John once more sat down to write to his Abigail. Philadelphia, July 3rd, 1776. Had declaration of independence been made seven months ago, it would have been attended with many great and glorious effects. We might, before this hour, have formed alliances with foreign states. We, we should have mastered Quebec and been in possession of Canada. You would perhaps wonder how such a declaration would have influenced our affairs in, in Canada. If, but if I could write with freedom, I could easily convince you that it would and explain to you the manner how. Others there are in the colonies who really wish that our enterprise in Canada would be defeated and the colonies might be brought into danger and distress between two fires and be thus induced to submit. Others really wish to defeat the expedition to Canada lest the conquest of it should elevate the minds of people too much to hearken to those terms of reconciliation which they believed would be if offered us. These jarring views and wishes and designs occasioned in opposition to many salutary measures which were proposed for the support of that expedition and caused obstructions, embarrassments, and steady delays which have finally lost us the province. All these causes, however, in conjunction, would not have disappointed us if it had not been for a misfortune which could not be foreseen and perhaps could not have 
men prevented. I mean, the prevalence of the smallpox among our troops, this, this fatal pestilence completed our destruction. It is a frown of providence upon us, which we ought to lay to heart. On the other hand, the, the lay of this declaration to this time has, has many great advantages as attending it. The hopes of reconciliation, which were fondly entertained by multitudes of honest and well-meaning, though weak and mistaken people, have been gradually and at last totally extinguished. Time has been given for the whole people to maturely to consider the great question of the independence to ripen their judgments, dissipate their fears, and lure their hopes to, by discussing it in newspapers and pamphlets, by debating it in assemblies, conventions, committees, and from safety and inspection in town and county meetings, as well as in private conversations, so that the whole people in every colony of the Thirteen have now adopted it as their own act. This will cement the Union, avoid those heats and perhaps convulsions which might have been occasioned by such a declaration six months ago. Days passed. The second day of July, 1776, will be the most memorable epoch in the history of America. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows and games and sports and guns and bells and bonfires and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other from this time forward forevermore. <laughs> You'll think me transported with enthusiasm. I am not. I am well aware of the toil and blood and treasure. It will cost us to maintain this declaration. It is important to defend these states. Yet through all the gloom, I can see the blue rays of ravishing light and glory. I, I can see the end is more than worth all the means. And posterity will triumph in that day's transaction, even though, even although we should do it, which I trust in God, we shall not. John Adams predicted that July 2nd would become a great American holiday. Adams thought that the vote for independence would be commemorated. He did not foresee that Americans, including himself, would instead celebrate Independence Day on the date um, that the announcement of the act was finalized, on July 4th, 1776. The wording of the Declaration of Independence was approved and sent to the printer for publication. John and Abigail were married for 54 years in a married life that saw them separated as much as they were together in such places as London, England, the, the Netherlands, and the first elected presidency to inhabit the White House. Abigail Adams in 1818, at the age of 74, died. John passed on July 4th, 1826, at the age of 90. It was the 50th anniversary of the adoption of the Declaration of Independence. Adam died at his home in Quincy, and told that it was the 4th, he answered clearly. It is a great day. It was a good day. John Adams was preceded in death only a few hours by fellow revolutionary patriot and congressional representative Thomas Jefferson. And that's the end. Well, that's the end of our presentation tonight. <laughs> Thank you to everybody who stayed all the way through. <laughs> These letters are very hard to, uh, very hard to, uh, to edit. <laughs> There's so much stuff. Oh.